Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Scleral Lens Encounter uh, webinar provided by the Scleral Lens Education Society. Tonight, Drs. Karen Lee and Kelsey Skidmore will be uh, presenting clinical cases, highlighting the Scleral Lens Encounter process, beginning with a general overview case history. Then they'll be delving into ancillary testing and end with a detailed review of Scleral Lens clinical observations. Dr. Karen Lee is a clinical assistant professor at the University of Houston College of Optometry. Prior to joining the University of Houston, Dr. Lee served as director of specialty contact lens clinic at the University of California, San Francisco ophthalmology department. She's a regular contributor to contact lens spectrum and is currently researching the sterility of scleral lens filling solutions. She's a reviewer for contact lens and interior eye and enjoys lecturing both domestically and overseas. Dr. Lee is a proud recipient of the George Mertz Contact Lens Residency Award, Visticon Clinical Excellence in Contact Lens Patient Care Award, and the Jack Bennett Humanitarian Award. Dr. Lee is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry and advisory board of the Gas Permeable Lens, uh, Gas Permeable Lens Institute, a member of the cornea and contact lens section of the AAO, a member of the Ocular Service Society, and is the past president of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for being here tonight. It's an honor to have you. Dr. Kelsey Skidmore graduated from the University of Houston College of Optometry, where she is now adjunct faculty and conducts clinical research with a focus on anterior segment and contact lens health in children. She also provides care as in private practice, where she specializes in specialty contact lenses and myopia management. Dr. Skidmore is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, as well as a fellow of the Scleral Lens Education Society. Thank you so much, Dr. Skidmore, for being here as well. Thank you so much for that intro, Elise. So let's go ahead and get started, you guys. Um, Kelsey and I really wanted to focus today on the Scleral Lens Encounter. And just kind of, since it's a student webinar, we really wanted to just walk you guys through what to do at each of these different visit types. And so we're gonna talk about, you know, just what scleral lenses are initially, and then go through the different exam flows for these three different types of encounters. Now, you guys know when we're looking at sclerals, there's a lot of different ways to do this. You can use the OCT, um, mainly we're using our slit lamp. Usually we're gonna use like, you know, optic section versus full illumination with sodium fluorescein. When do we do what? We're gonna talk about that today, okay? Always keep in the back of your mind, regardless of the type of lens that you're using, anytime you're fitting a scleral lens, you want to be bathing the entire cornea in fluid. So we're going to vault over the cornea. You don't want to land on the limbus either, though, right? Because all your limbal stem cells are there and they're very delicate. So vault over that area too. And then try to land as gently on that conjunctival surface as possible. Now, when we think about who should be fit into a scleral lens, so many different indications, right? I'm not going to list all of these out for you, but Kelsey, when you think about your clinic, what's the most common patient you see walk through your door for scleral lenses? Probably keratoconus, any sort of regular cornea, lots of post-LASIK ectasia, uh, transplants, but RK is one I've seen a lot more the last few years that they're starting to have issues. Yeah, I completely agree, especially at UH, we see a ton of keratoconus and a lot of RK. Here and there, more ocular surface disease patients are coming in too. Don't forget though, you also can fit scleral lenses over patients who have like regular corneas. Maybe they just have a lot of astigmatism or really high refractive error and just aren't doing well in a GP lens. Now, to stay up to date with the different types of terminologies, because you want to be speaking the same language as everybody else, the Scleral Lens Education Society um, really promotes this official guide. So go ahead and visit our website. You can find this PDF online for free. And um, it was worked on by, you know, UHCO's Maria Walker, along with Elise Kramer, who just introduced us. The basics for the terminology that I want you guys to orient yourselves with today, when we talk about the optic zone, that really refers to this yellow portion in the middle. That's your central, almost like your base curve radius. It's the central area that houses all of the optics. After that, you have the transition zone, which starts to slowly go over the limbus. That's the areas in green. And then finally, we want that lens to have a smooth landing zone because that's where that lens is going to first start to meet on the conjunctiva and land on there. 
So once upon a time, a new patient walks into your office and is interested in scleral lenses. What next? Step one is getting a very thorough history of present illness. Why does this patient even want scleral lenses? Do they need scleral lenses? What have they done before? What has worked? What hasn't worked? Getting the full history, getting on your patient, their visual demands, what are their jobs, expectations of what they expect out of scleral lenses, what they've heard before. Maybe they already worn scleral lenses and are coming to you as a new fit or refit. Uh, we want to know average wear time. How long have they had the lenses on today before you've seen them? What solutions they're using, what the lens handling, thorough history of what they have already done before. And diving into medical history, what other conditions do they have besides the ocular condition they're seeing you for, whether it be Stevens-Johnson syndrome, Sjogren's, autoimmune disease, and also going into the medication since so many of those also affect the ocular surface. As for ocular history, really delve into this. Do they have dry eye? Maybe they're keratoconus, but that doesn't mean they have only one disease going on. Going into the dry eye, what treatments they've used, any kind of other ocular surface diseases, irregular cornea, including both pellucid, keratoconus, what sort of allergies they have going on, and their contact lens history. Like I mentioned before, maybe they already have worn scleral lenses, they may have done hybrids or RGPs, getting a good idea of where they've come from. And also, are they post-surgical, uh, whether it be intacts, RK, corneal transplant, getting a full history of how long it was since their surgeries and any complications they might have had. When it comes to testing, you'll try to do as many of the preliminary tests that you normally do on regular patients, but note that some of these will be a bit more difficult depending on what disease this patient might have. Uh, visual acuity and autorefraction and refraction are the big ones that will be a more challenging than the average patient. Um, auto refraction in particular, you'll get errors with the high cornea regularity. Refraction, this is what most um, irregular corneas, keratoconus transplant, they hate this part of the exam. So being really patient, uh, working with them, you know, ensuring that they understand that vision won't be perfect. You may not spend a lot of time on it if it's glasses aren't even a backup option. Will they even fill the prescription? Get enough information, but don't go into too much detail. When it comes to keratometry, it could be questionable reliability as well. Um, it's good to always get a topography as well as any other prelims you may need, whether it be cover tests, confrontational visual fields. Anything else that you recommend for your students, Karen? I think the main thing to remember is when you first see these patients, a lot of times you're still doing a comprehensive eye exam. So I don't want my students to get flustered and be like, oh my God, it's a scleral lens patient. Like I have no idea what to do now, right? Still kind of flow through your usual but then keep in the back of your mind the things that will be difficult. Like when you go to the autorefractor, don't be shocked if you're pushing that button and it's just error, 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 not reading anything, right? Um, because their corneas are just so distorted. And again, like how Kelsey mentioned about the refraction, sometimes for insurance purposes, you need to show visual acuity improvement from being corrected in glasses versus being corrected in scleral lenses. However, if they're not gonna fill it, don't spend an hour refracting them. They're here for scleral lenses. So we wanna get a lens on the eye as soon as possible. Now, after doing your regular prelims, we'll do many extra tests that are listed here. Corneal topography is a huge one, along with pachymetry. Some topographers should do both of those, along with the HVID. So be sure to either measure that manually or look at whatever instrument you use. Uh, many practices are now using scleral profilometry to look at not just the cornea irregularities, but also the sclera as well. Uh, especially with transplant patients, you'll pay special attention to the endothelial cell density with specular microscopy. So you'll make sure that you're using caution if they're under the 800 cells. When it comes to topography, be sure to really know what you're looking at there. Note that elevation does not always equal whether the highest power or the steepest. You know, keratoconus may be that way, but corneal transplants, uh, nodular generations, there may be areas of the cornea that are a lot higher elevation that don't always match the steepness. And scleral lenses should always vault over that best fit sphere. In addition to corneal topography, something that may be a little more helpful, because again, we're gonna design a lens that completely vaults over that cornea, right? 
uh, we're landing on the sclera though. So we need to know more about the actual shape of that sclera and that will help us design a lens that is comfortable for the patient. And so how you can do that, three different devices, you have the SMAP 3D from Visionary Optics, you also have the Eaglet Eye Surface Profiler, that's compatible with many more lens designs, not just Visionary Optics lens designs. And then if you're fortunate and you already have the Pentacam from Oculus, some versions of the Pentacam have um, scleral shape information as well. So what studies have found when they look at patients and study their scleral shape, is that there are four main categories out there. And the main thing to think about is when you are trying to design this lens, if your patient has a very asymmetric shape, you're gonna have to design a lens where the landing zone is asymmetric as well. One of the beautiful things about having machinery like this is you can take a map of that sclera, zap it over to the manufacturer, and they will just design a lens for you. You just have to over-refract that day in office to tell them what power to put into the lens. So when we think about these four different shapes, what are we talking about? Uh, we usually think spherical lenses, right, or spherical shape, like your, your basketball. Um, group two would be your toric regular shape. And so if we think about how we describe astigmatism and toricity, usually we talk about a football, right? And so um, if we kind of focus on that football and look at this little graph here, uh, it's showing you that essentially the peaks and the elevations are corresponding to these different areas of your sclera that is toric. Now, if you look at the majority of your patients though, 65% of them aren't really spherical or toric. They actually are in this asymmetric group. So if we think about our football again, think of more like a defaded lumpy football where everything's just kind of different from each other and you can't really fit a nice easy peasy lens on that eye. And so these are the people that really will benefit from a more custom landing zone to say, okay? Now, after you gather all this preliminary data, it's time to do the refraction. Um, Kelsey and I kind of mentioned already how we kind of go back and forth. You got to talk to your attending. Some of your attendings want you to spend more time on the refraction. Other attendings might not want you to, and they just want to get a lens on. You just make sure you know what your plan is when you go in there so that um, you are following along and you're not going to be late for your next patient. After refraction, you're going to move on to your slit lamp and you're going to do your normal slit lamp exam, looking at lids, lashes, cornea, all of that. Pay attention. If your patient is keratoconic, look for your typical keratoconic findings. Because this lens is landing on the sclera, when it comes to the conge, make sure you're looking for any lumps and bumps, right? After you've done looking at the anterior seg health, you might want to take a quick peek and look at the posterior seg via undilated views. But at this first encounter where I am focusing on fitting the scleral lens, I don't expect my students to dilate the patients by any means because we just don't have time for all of that. And so after this part, again, look for your typical keratoconic findings. So maybe they have a Fleischer's ring. If they have any type of scarring, we're gonna wanna note all of that because baseline findings really kind of let us know if the lens is you know, impacting the ocular health in a negative way. Now, when it comes to those lumps and bumps that I had mentioned, right? Sometimes we can fit a scleral lens over top or we can try to avoid these little bumps here. Uh, but there are gonna be patients out there, you guys, that just aren't gonna do well with a scleral lens like this person here that has a plate for his glaucoma. You know, fitting a, G, a scleral lens against there might be you know, dangerous. You might rub over that conge and cause it to perforate. And so for that case, talk to your patients tell them if they are a good candidate or not a good candidate. Because at this point of the exam, you're gonna try to analyze all your data. You're gonna put everything together, right? Your subjective information, your objective information. Then you're gonna go to your attending or if you're already graduated, you're gonna put it all together and decide for yourself, like what am I gonna do for this patient? And if you decide they are a good scleral lens candidate, then now you can go ahead and start the fitting process. Perfect, good point there. Sclerons is great, but got to look all the information together. This just goes into an overview of where we'll be delving into in the next part of the lecture. Basically, with all your information now, what do you do next? 
So choose the overall diameter. Every fit set is different. Some may have two different diameters in the fit set. Some may only have one, but you can order higher. This is where your HVID comes in handy. You'll go a little bit larger than the HVID to pick your overall diameter. Most will range from 14 and a half to 20. Most fitting sets come around 16 to 20. So pick your first lens and we'll go ahead and put it on the eye. Looking at these two pictures to the right, that top picture shows when the OAD is too small. You can see the edge of the scleral lens is resting in the limbus, which you prefer not to versus the picture at the bottom showing perfect landing off to the side. You have a little bit of space where it lands on the conge. Also to look at the lens designs, more than just diameters, some lens designs have different customizations. You can pick an oblate design, which for keratoconus is a great one, versus more oblate, which is your RK patients mostly. If you think you may want to do other customizations, such as maybe it's a dry eye patient or a patient that has more of a regular cornea but a high prescription, these are some patients that may be older and want multifocals. So picking a design where you can do the customizations you want. Also, if you have those lumps and bumps that Karen mentioned, if you want to do a notch, a lift, different landing zones, kind of take that into account before you put your first lens on. Every fitting guide is different. As you do more and more, you get an understanding of what lens to start with for this type of eye and how to troubleshoot. But when in doubt, start with the fitting guide and go based on the HVID and the case from your topography and what type of cornea you're fitting. When it comes to putting the lens on the eye, You'll put it on the plunger and you'll want to dab a little bit of that fluorescein tip in there so that when you put it on the eye, you can actually see the tear reservoir. Whenever you fill it, you're going to use these preservative free solutions. It bathes the eye for hours. So we never like preservatives to stick on these very high risk, fragile corneas for long. So always preservative free, whether you pick the bottle form, which is pure lens, or the many vials that we have available now. We'll dive more into these later and which ones are buffered, unbuffered, and where you find them. Okay, here goes some insertion. So here we have a nice video just kind of showing how you would ideally apply the lens on your patient in office. You ask the patient to hold their lower lid, you hold the upper lid. Hopefully the patient keeps looking straight down at the plunger and you center that lens right over the cornea and you go straight up. We included some you know written out information just in case but maybe you don't want your patient standing maybe they're wheelchair bound or they you know just are not the most stable if they are in the chair some things to think about is always just raise the patient up quite high so it's easier on yourself it really comes down to lid control so sometimes when students come to me and they're like i can't get the lens on i'm freaking out like please help I do try to go watch them. The main thing that I see that's holding them back is instead of holding that upper lid at the base of the eyelashes, they're like holding their patient's eyebrow, right? And so really dry the eyelids off so that you're not slipping all over the place and then grab that upper lid. And I tell my students, just use those eyelashes like little anchors to give you grip as you're pulling that upper lid up. And then Always tell the patient, you know, try your best, tuck your chin all the way to your chest because you're fighting against gravity. So if your patient's not looking straight down at the floor, all of that beautiful saline that you have highlighted yellow is going to land in their lap. And so if you don't have paper towels or if they're not wearing an apron, you have now just stained their pants. And um, fortunately, sodium fluorescein does wash out but it's not the best color to get in that area, okay? So try to put down a paper towel or apron, get your patient looking down as far as possible. And best case scenario, they can hope open their lid before you, that lower lid, and you're holding the upper lid. But if you have a tough one, there are times where you have to do the headlock method, meaning you can see Dr. Tomiyama's arm here. Her left arm, her forearm, is essentially pushing my head down because I'm just a terrible patient that's fighting her and trying to sit back up. No, use your forearm, keep them down parallel to the floor. If they're looking all over the place, try to give them something to look at, maybe a bottle of tropicamide in their lap, any type of fixation target. And every now and then you do have patients that come in that maybe have a nystagmus that needs scleral lenses as well. Try to rotate them into their null position so that they're not bouncing all over the place. Don't chase the eye by any means, just kind of wait patiently. When in doubt, if you really think you can't do it, just grab your attending. We are more than happy to come help you, okay?
And so once the lens is on the eye, you're ready to look at it behind the slit lamp. You want to start with a overview. So nice cobalt blue light. Look at everything. Get a lay of the land. All right. Once you're done looking at the lay of the land, then you're going to switch to this white light optic section where you will be sweeping back and forth, assessing the rest of the lens fit. Now, before we jump to that optic section, when you are looking with that bright blue light, ideally you see a lens like this, where there is green, beautiful vault going all the way across from limbus to limbus. If you don't see this, and instead you see something along the lines of these, first photo on the left, a giant air bubble, photo in the middle, lots of corneal touch. Maybe we didn't follow the fit guide properly, or maybe our data just wasn't inaccurate because our corneas are so irregular. Photo on the far right, really, really poor lens wetting. Over refracting this lens is going to be really difficult for you. If you see any of these three things, stop, remove the lens, reapply if it's the first or the third situation, right? Try to keep them from looking around to prevent these bubbles from happening. Rub the lens really well. In clinic, I find BioTrue really helps with poor lens wetting. So maybe, you know, rub it with some unique pH or some other non-abrasive GP cleaner, then give it a rub with BioTrue before filling it up again. In the case of the central touch patient, you're going to have to change lenses. Go to a diagnostic lens that is much steeper than what you currently have on the eye. Because again, we want to find a lens that's vaulting over the entire cornea from limbus to limbus. Now, good point. If you don't have a good ocular surface, huge bubbles, you're not going to get anything accurate from here on out. So stepping up to the next step is evaluating the apical clearance. For this, you'll switch from the cobalt blue to your white light. You'll put it into an optic section. And we're looking at this. Many people make the mistake of actually comparing that to your reservoir to the cornea itself. You have to remember these corneas that we're fitting, they're not your average 555 microns. And the clearance or the apical thickness of the cornea can vary widely, especially in those keratoconus patients. So look at your trial lens. Most of them will be about 0.35 millimeters or 350 microns. Compare your lens reservoir to that thickness. You can get a lot more accurate idea of how much clearance you have over that cornea. We expect the lens to sink on the conjunctiva over time. So look at initially, but remember, we'll have to let the lens settle. This is a beautiful picture. Wait, hold on, Kelsey, hold on. I, I got lost. Can we break down this optic section just for a second? So if I'm looking at this optic section, uh, the most normal thing that we can think about, right? So we know this is the cornea. This is what our cornea looks like. In front of the cornea, this green band, that is our tear reservoir, that liquid that we highlighted with fluorescein. Then in front of that, that black band you're telling me is the scleral lens. Mm -hmm. And then over that is a green band, which is basically the tear layer on the front surface. So you're telling me to compare the lens thickness to that fluid reservoir. So if my vial or if my fitting guide tells me my lens is 0.35 millimeters or 350 micron thick, that's essentially where that little red line is, that black thickness there. I'm comparing that little red line to this orange line, which is supposed to represent like the reservoir that we highlighted with fluid. If I think those two bands are essentially the same, like a one-to-one -one ratio, then technically my apical clearance should be 350 microns too, because my lens was that thick, right? Yes, that is perfect. So looking here, I love this guy from the Fair State Fit Guide. It looks and kind of breaks down what it looks like when you have not enough clearance closer to that 50 microns or way too much clearance like the 700 you see here on the far right. You know, comparing it to that 350, you can see for that 700, we are over double that when we're looking at the green tier reservoir. I mean, personally, if I put the lens on, it's wetting well, but I do my optic section, I go over the cornea and I see 700 microns, I go ahead and bump it down a little bit, go back to my fit set, go to a little bit different base curve so that way it's closer to the cornea. So after it settles, we're looking more at that 500 range. Seven, 
700 to 500, a little bit too much. If we go down to this middle picture here, that's 350. After it settles, we still have just enough clearance, but not too much. Also keeping in mind, look at top to bottom. We tend to just look right in the center over the apex, but most of these corneas, they're very irregular. You can see this range much more superior and inferior, but right over the apical, kind of right below the pupil there, that's when it's more small. So most of these won't have uniform. Whenever I'm making my charts and documenting everything, I'll usually document the entire range from superior to inferior and right over the apex. So when I see the patient back later, I can really have an idea of how much it's settling over different areas. Now that we have done our apical clearance, let's move on out, limbal clearance. You'll sweep this just like the video we saw before, going from limbus to limbus, nasal to temporal and vice versa, using an optic section, white light, noting that tear reservoir thickness all the way across. We want it to be about 50 to 100 microns. It'll depend on your lens design here. When you get less than 50 microns, it's so hard to see that fluor fluorescein dye under there. Many cases when I'm worried that I might be touching, I just go to the OCT. You can have the patient gaze in different directions and see exactly how much clearance you have by measuring it. When you have higher clearance, you're more likely to get complications like fogging and it limits the oxygenation. In lower clearance, you just don't want it having severe staining or having a compression ring that we'll look at a little bit later. So one thing to keep in mind too, you guys, uh, when you're looking at these, pay attention to where your light source is. It's really easy to look at the right-hand side of this lens and think, oh man, I see darkness there. So that must be touch. So I don't have enough limbal clearance, right? Well, really, if your light source is shining from the left, that lens is actually just casting a shadow. And that shadowing effect can really throw you off. Um, compare that to the photo down below, that looks more like true limbal touch where you have a black ring on like either side of that limbus. And then up top here, this is really nice. If you look at that, you can kind of see the faint green just traveling over the limbus and slowly kind of onto the conge as well. That's all beautiful. But like Kelsey said, a lot of times, less than 50 microns, you really can't see even with a slit lamp. And so um, when in doubt, sometimes I'll just dispense the lens and then monitor for corneal health changes. So if they come back and that limbus looks fine, I'm not really going to make a whole lot of changes in that area. Now, that's a good point. Staining at the follow-ups is huge. So much goes on when you're not looking, when they're not sitting in your chair. So like Karen said, you're looking for that faint green band. You look at the picture on the right, very, very minimal. You can hardly see it. After that lens settles, you're pretty much guaranteed that it's going to be resting on those, the limbus right there. The middle picture showing that optimal 50 to 100 microns clearance. It's still large enough that the human eye can see. Versus when you go over to the edge over here on the right side, picture with the fluorescein, you can see definitely a little bit more. You're looking at 100, 150, so a bit of excess mm -hmm. may not get enough oxygen there. So if we put all of this together, um, we already talked about, hey, overall diameter, get the lens on, overview of the fit. Now look at the apical clearance and look at that limbal clearance, right? So if we look at this video, white light optic section in the very middle, comparing this black band to the green band, maybe a one-to-one -one ratio. Maybe the green band is a tiny bit thinner than the black band, but still very reasonable. Um, we're sweeping over to the limbus, very, very faint green, maybe even a little too faint, hard to say. And we're gonna sweep over to the other limbus. Other things to note in this fit right now, the front surface of this lens just isn't wetting very well. So this is a Sjogren's patient. So remember your ocular surface disease patients, you guys, you're really just trading one dry surface for another. So if they had a lot of corneal staining and filaments and all of that, I'm not expecting their scleral lens to be the most wettable and beautiful scleral lens either, because they're still going to have those tear film issues. But that's essentially how you would be looking at your apical clearance here and then looking at your limbal clearance, going from side to side, paying attention to that green band and expecting it to slowly disappear as you head over to that limbus. 
Next thing we're going to look at is this landing zone, that scleral landing. This setup's a little bit different from all the other ones. Instead of an optic section, you're going to still use white light, but now we're going to go to low magnification and we are going to dim down the illumination. And I usually try to get my light as wide as possible because I want to see everything. I want to see the big picture. If you use magnification and illumination that's just way too high, it's very easy to wash out a lot of these subtle findings. In the photos here, what you're seeing, this up top on the far right would be what is quite ideal. You're paying attention to the blood vessels, how they change or hopefully don't change as they head towards that scleral lens edge. Um, here you can kind of tell, maybe it's a little snug, right? Like these blood vessels, they hit the edge of that lens and then they kind of disappear. That's not totally normal. That just means it's a little tight and we don't want to see that. Should it be even tighter, well, now you're going to see significant blanching or compression, um, just essentially white areas where those blood vessels are getting choked off. And on the opposite end, you might have an edge that's a little bit loosey-goosey and is lifted away from the eye. This isn't going to be comfortable for the patient either. Imagine every time they blink, they're going to feel this little edge here scraping against their eyelid. It's a little channel for air bubbles and for debris to form under the lens. And so try to describe what you're seeing uh, to your attending and make as many notes in your chart as possible. One other thing that you might notice on scleral lenses are toric markings. So toric markings kind of look like your soft lens toric markings, little tick marks. Every company puts them in different areas depending on the type of lens that you have, whether it's a front surface toric back surface torque, maybe it's both front and back surface torque, right? Depending on what you see, you still want to do the same thing. Thin your light beam down, line it up over the torque markings, and try to calculate the degrees of rotation because you are going to want to let your consultant know how the lens is rotated on the eye so that they make the proper changes for you. And if you are doing an over refraction that involves, you know, incorporating some residual astigmatism, that's gonna matter too. Just like GPs, we can dot scleral lenses. So this photo in the far left, we can see that there's a tiny little black marking down below. That is one single dot. Scleral lenses that have one black dot usually mean it's a right lens. Um, two black dots means it's a left lens. And all the time in clinic, I have patients who come in, they may have mixed their lenses up, you as the student, make sure you catch that, right? You just come in and let your attending know like, hey, I think my patient's lenses are mixed up. The right lens has two dots on there and the left lens has one dot. And I think it's supposed to be the other way around. And um, that will help you solve a lot of issues, right? If they're not seeing well and the fit just doesn't quite match up with what they had documented in the past. So again, when you're looking at the landing zone, you're paying attention to areas of blanching. The easiest way to think about it Think of these blood vessels as little water hoses on the eyeball, okay? Imagine a water hose on the ground. If you step on it, all of the liquid in that water hose is gonna back up. So all of this blood is gonna back up and cause this injection here. And then it kind of goes away because this lens edge is just so tight. And once you get past that area of tightness, all that blood just kind of surges back out again. So imagine the blood vessels are little water hoses, Lens edge, if it's tight, causes a backup and nothing comes out. It just really struggles. So if I'm looking at that landing zone behind the slit lamp, here I am. I have my nice dim white illumination. I'm zooming in and out, paying attention to the blood vessels and how they are traveling towards the edge of that lens. If we really pay close attention, we can kind of see actual individual red blood cells moving under there. So I would pay attention to, you know, are the large vessels blanching or just the, you know, little fragile ones? How many clock hours? Because if it's not affecting a ton of that eye, I might not make changes. A little bit of blanching is totally acceptable. And then again, notice that ocular surface, how it's just not, you know, wetting the best. You can see those areas of dry spots. This is that same Sjogren's patient. Yeah, I make a good point, especially those Sjogren's patients treating their dry eye along the ocular surface, along with the fit is super important. Moving over here to the over refraction, 
Of course, most of these patients will not see well through their initial diagnostic scleral lens. Sometimes you get that one in a million, you put it on, and it's like, wow, they're 20 20. But where to start? If you can, go to the over, do a auto refraction. It gives you an idea of where to start. Sometimes you could do retinoscopy, depending. Um, if I can't get over the auto refraction, there's someone over there. What I do is I just use the phoropter, get behind, I put the big E up on the chart, and do large steps. You kind of have an idea based on the refraction or previous lenses what direction you might need to go, plus or minus. I use the plus or minus three knob and start moving. And I ask, can you see the E, B, or no E? And they'll say, oh, the E's there now. So you know you're going in the right direction. Do another click of three, and they're like, oh, even better. Do another click of three. Nope, went opposite direction. And that case, I go down the chart a little bit, use the plus or minus one diopter and kind of fine tune and bracket it down. Biggest thing is remind the patient to blink. A lot mm -hmm. of times their surface might not be wetting. You're using a trial lens that may have been stored dry for a while. It's not super conditioned. They can have like Karen mentioned Sjogren's mm -hmm. disease. So I remind them blink. It may not be perfect. If they need to see options again, just keep them relaxed because this is all kind of new to them. It can be a little daunting at first. Mm -hmm. I always start with spherical over refraction. Um, say you get them down to 2030. You don't know exactly how far down you can go. Before I check sill, I'll usually switch over to pinhole and see, can we get better than 2030 with pinhole? If so, then maybe we need to start fishing for some sill. And then I'll document the spherical over fraction and what sort of VA we got. Always document your pinhole acuity. And then also start fishing for sill. I'll sometimes throw a diopter of sill in and actually have the patient put their fingers up on the axis wheel and bracket back and forth to see is there any area, you know, have a pick a letter like a K or a T or an E. Can you make it any better than you're at right now? If so, then we may need to add some front surface torque to the lens. If they're staying pretty well with spherical though, I rarely do a front surface torque on the first lens dispense. We sometimes incorporate that in later after they're used to insertion removal and maybe they kick out that seal after they're used to the lens. When we're removing, biggest mistake is going right smack in the center. You really want to do off center placement. You wet the tip of the small plunger. So instead of using the large one you use to insert, the one that's more like a pedestal, you'll use the small one. I usually wet it with the tip of Fossa Simplus, Unique pH, or whatever saline I'm using. Mm -hmm. You'll go right to the edge of the lens. I usually go somewhere between four, six, five o'clock, somewhere around there at the bottom. Press slightly in, wiggle, and then pull it off the eye. You'll go right for where the colored part of the eye meets the white part of the eye. That's how I usually explain it to patients. If you go in the center, it just doesn't feel too great. You're not going to break that section. You always have to go towards the edge. Here we have a nice video just showing Dr. Morrison removing the lens, placing the plunger right at six o'clock, breaks that seal, and it comes right off without scraping uh, Dr. Johnson's eye, fortunately. And so once you have taken that lens off, your patient's pretty much ready to leave. You're going to schedule them to come back for a scleral lens dispense. I usually tell my patients to schedule two weeks out from today because that's how long it takes me to get a lens. Or some offices choose to just wait for that actual lens to arrive before contacting the patient to schedule. Either way is fine. Um, during that time in between, I will give the patient a little bit of homework. So whether it's lid hygiene or just watch a video on the Scleral Lens Education Society YouTube page that talks about application and removal. I'm just doing things to make that dispense visit a little bit easier. So try to give them as much homework so that way um, when they do come back, they have less questions or their questions are at least tailored down and they've gotten most of the answers already from the homework that you have given them. After the patient leaves, you can order your lens. You are going to contact your consultant if you have any photos or videos, you can send it their way. Uh, remember, basic GP rules still apply. So when you're changing things around, if you're manipulating base curve, you have to sand back. If you have a large over refraction, don't forget to vertex it before incorporating. Or if you don't want to vertex it yourself, make sure the consultant knows so that they can vertex it for you. Customize anything you need to customize. This is the part that really gets people to sometimes. 
make sure you know what your manufacturer can do. Don't promise your patient, I can do a you know, front surface, multifocal toric with toric landing zones if you're not sure, because not every manufacturer can put on all those bells and whistles to every single um, lens design out there. And then at the school, you guys, it's so common for these lenses in these huge diagnostic sets to just get mixed up because, you know, you guys are trying to work as fast as you can, clean everything, put them all away. It's not uncommon for the lenses to just get into the wrong case. And so if you are fortunate enough to have a design that has markings on the lens, like the Zen lens here, if you think you're using Z7, the newer fit sets, when you look at the lens, you should see actual etchings on there that say Z-7. If not, consider verifying before talking to the consultant. So that way they are making changes in the proper direction that you want. Now, I think we have all been there before where you order the lens, the patient comes in, you're super excited and they put it on and they're like, doc, I can't see anything. Usually because you're pasting it off a lens that's in the wrong slot. So maybe it's one that doesn't have the etchings on it. When in doubt, before I order, I always go to the lensometer, to the radioscope, verify everything. So that way it makes their initial dispense way more smooth. So going through, they're coming back up for their dispense. They have their lens, super excited. Don't forget to also verify any changes to their history. Uh, ocular, medical, any new medications they might be on. Check their entering VAs, whatever they come in wearing, and then slit lip exam. I always want to make sure that everything looks perfect on that cornea the way you left it two weeks ago before you start putting a lens on. A lot of the time, especially I've had patients that are way out of the lenses, they come in, we look at the cornea before and they have an abrasion or they've developed a peripheral ulcer from their last lens and a lot can change in two weeks. So make sure to double check all those things. I always apply the lens on the patient first before we go through the process of insertion, removal training. I put the lens on the patient just like we did before and do initial VA check, fit assessment like we did, looking at apical, limbal, the way it's landing, an overview of how this lens fits. We should have a pretty good idea of what it should look like based on your previous exam, but document everything on how it fits and then overfract. If everything looks good and vision is acceptable, vision fits, both are perfect, not perfect, but acceptable, right? Then you can go ahead and start the actual application and removal process. The goal is to be able to have the patient put that lens on as smoothly as Dr. Walker did right there. And then in terms of removal, patients hopefully are able to hold that upper lid, hold the lower lid on their own, place that removal plunger at six o'clock or 12 o'clock, whatever's comfortable for them, just not in the middle, right? And then they just break that suction and remove that lens from the eye. And so you will spend the majority of your time walking them through that. Once they've been able to complete the a &R training, maybe like three times on their own in office, usually is what I shoot for, then you're ready to start talking to them about the different lens care systems out there. Now, your ocular surface disease patients, they really need to rub those lenses, right? You saw how bad that front surface was wetting. Make sure they're rubbing to try to get everything off. When you're thinking about multi-purpose solutions versus hydrogen peroxide-based solutions, I mean, I like hydrogen peroxide because it is preservative free. Um, but if your patient doesn't, you know, have sensitivities like that, don't be afraid to use a multi-purpose solution. The main thing to remember is avoid abrasive cleaners. So anything that looks milky or says like extra strength cleaner, um, those tend to have silica gel beads in them that can be really abrasive. Uh, these lenses are made from really high decay materials that tend to be a little softer. And so if you're rubbing these gel beads against that lens surface, it's going to scratch it up and it's not going to, um, you know, wet well and be comfortable for the patient because more deposits will form. And so make sure you educate your patient on all of this in terms of lens care. Then you have your actual filling solutions. We've listed them all out here for you. Uh, the first four are pretty much all preservative-free salines. Some of them do have buffer, so boric acid. So if you have a patient that says to you, you know, my filling solution burns, it might be that boric acid. So consider switching them to something that's buffer-free and preservative-free. Two of the newer ones that just came out is Nutrafil and Vibrant View. 
Neutrophil is interesting in that it has electrolytes. I think of it like Gatorade for the eyeball. So it has sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, all built into there that's supposed to help supplement the tear film. Uh, we do have samples of those in clinic and you probably do too. So don't be afraid to offer those to your patients and let them try it out to see if they notice any difference. I love patient handouts because everything I say and I talk a lot, as you can tell, patients gonna forget like 90% of it by the time they get home. So give them as many handouts as possible. This one here from the AOCLE.org, you can print it off online. Um, it goes over how to clean your lenses. It goes over the different solutions. So what are you cleaning in? What are you soaking in? What are you filling in? You're writing all of that out for the patient so they're not gonna forget. Another thing that might be helpful too, it's just handwriting on there when their warranty expires because you don't want these patients to disappear on you and not come back for months and months and then finally come back because they have a problem and it's just like way too long. No, that's something I run into in private practice a lot too. Documentation is huge. We always have a little kit with them, all their solutions, where they can find them. A lot of the times they'll run out of solution. They can't find their preservative free. They'll just go to the nearest pharmacy, get the generic brand of a soft lens cleaner and just start filling it because they think all saline's created equal. Um, great point, Karen, with the warranty. We actually made some that are bright yellow, have all the insertion removal when their warranty is, and I have it in a little square lens kit and they keep their yellow picture with them all the time it helps mm -hmm. so much yeah and so if you're in private practice and you choose to make your own application and removal handout that's great if you find yourselves not having the time to do that bausch.com has a really good one that kind of goes over the application process with the plunger and the removal process and then on the back of this handout there's actually a plunger free method and so it kind of shows patients how you can balance the lens on the fingers like Dr. Walker here and then slowly apply that lens. It's kind of nice being, you know, not tied to your plunger, being able to operate without it. Because if you lose your plunger, you don't want to be stuck with that lens on your eye for three days or anything crazy like that, right? Um, but remember, patients will have to have really clean hands if they're going to do this. So educate them on both ways. I usually start with the plunger method. Once they've mastered the plunger method, I might try this three finger method so that they're not stuck to their plungers all the time. General recommendations after I dispense that lens, some patients will still have dryness even though we've bathing the cornea with fluid. Don't be afraid to use preservative free artificial tears whether it's over top of the scleral lens or inside of the scleral lens. If your patient does have, say, glaucoma medications, or maybe they're on Zydra for dry eye, you still got to wait that 15-minute FDA recommendation before putting that lens back on after the drop goes in. I really don't like my patients sleeping in their lenses. You will have patients here and there who say to you, like, I, I take a nap every now and then with my lens on. Is that terrible? I mean, I just warn them that their lenses might get a little uncomfortable and tight when they wake up and maybe just remove it for a bit. But you're going to have patients come in that wear their lenses for like a week straight. And it's going to be one of the yuckiest things you'll see because it's very, think of like a lava lamp. Think lava lamp, scleral lens combination. Okay. And then when I dispense the lens, I tell them, hey, you're coming back for a follow up. Please wear your lenses into that appointment. Wear your lenses for at least four hours prior because I need to see what it's going to look like on the eye. And so usually if I'm ordering them another lens, like let's say at the dispense appointment, I already saw things I wanted to change or there was an over refraction that I want to incorporate, I'm probably going to want to do like a two week follow up because again, that's going to take two weeks for you to get that new lens. If you're very concerned, if your patient has like a persistent epithelial defect that you're fitting them in a scleral for, don't be afraid to see these high risk patients more frequently. You do what you feel is right for you in this. So what do we do with these follow-ups? <clears throat> history, history, history again. Whenever the patients come in for their follow-ups, getting a thorough history is key to making sure they're actually using the lenses how they should be. Asking about comfort, maybe comfort's good the first four hours, but by hour seven or eight they're having issues, make sure to actually ask how that changes over their wear time. 
when it comes to solutions, I feel like lots of us just get in the habit of, oh, you're using pure lens to fill, or oh, you're using unique pH to clean, right? I feel like those leading questions kind of set them up to want to please you and say, yes, I'm doing all of that right, Doc. I'm doing everything. I'm not overwhelmed. and I'm not sleeping. Keep it more open-ended. Ask them, what are you using to fill the lens? What are you using to clean? How many hours are you wearing them? All of those things uh, really help get a better, more accurate idea of how they're doing with the lenses. Like Karen said, ideally after four hours of wear, you've already seen them at dispense. You know how it looks at in that first hour or so. We want to see after it four hours. And if the patient's having issues by hour eight, I schedule them very end of the day so we can see the lens, how it looks at eight hours. So of course, check their vision and over refract. You want to do that before you ever remove the lens. Same thing with the fit, looking at the surface, chamber debris, looking at the front surface. Do we need to alter the solutions they use? On the inside, outside, where are they getting debris if they notice they're getting cloudiness? Is it inside the lens? Is it on top of the lens? And then not forgetting that there is more than just the lens on their eye, looking at their health of their tears, their cornea, conjunctiva, all the other areas that can be affected. Again, case history, getting very thorough history there. Looking at this video here, you can see a little debris there on the lens or on top of it. I usually ask, are they putting the lens on before or after makeup? Looking at that fit assessment, important that you don't remove the lens. We'll show you in just a second a great technique in evaluating. You can see here it's so hard to evaluate. You can't really see without fluorescein where that tear reservoir is. You see the cornea bright and clear. You see the reflection of the front surface of the lens, but super hard to actually view that reservoir and see where the clearance is, which just using white light and not the fluorescein. So to put fluorescein onto the eye, just moisten your strip. I usually aim for the superior bulbar conge and be really generous with it. Um, superior bulbar conge, because then gravity kind of lets that dye seep downwards. Hopefully some of it will get under the lens. If it doesn't, that's not necessarily a bad thing either, but just be really generous when you're putting that fluorescein on. Let's actually watch that one more time because that was great. So moisten that fluorescein strip. Aim for that superior bulbar conge over the lens edge and just smudge all of it on there. And hopefully something will get underneath the lens. Once that dye is allowed to sit for a little bit, go through your same fit assessment like how we did in your actual fitting visit and your follow-up and your dispense visit, right? You're gonna look at your overall fit first. Then you're gonna optic section white light very middle out to the limbus focus on the landing zone afterwards. And then once you're done looking at the fit, remove those lenses once your attending looks as well, okay? Don't remove them until your attending looks. Um, but once they're done and you've gotten that over refraction and everything else, remove those lenses and make sure the ocular health is stable. Or if you are seeing changes, does it correlate with what the lenses looked like? And so what changes should we make to improve their ocular health? Those are all questions that I'm thinking about as I'm scanning over the conge and the cornea and all of that. Once you've gathered all of that data, you will, again, follow up as necessary. If you decide you do need to make changes, two weeks, if you order something new, if you feel like best case scenario, that first lens is beautiful and you're like, oh, no changes, uh, you can technically finalize it, but I would still follow them up like one month afterwards to make sure that, hey, it's still going well. And also, if I do need to make changes, I'm still in that warranty period. Most manufacturers give you 90 days to make as many changes as you need. After that, especially if they're a first time scleral lens wearer, see them back in six months, make sure they're still doing okay. And they'll still need to do their yearly comprehensives. In summary, you guys, Scleral lenses really come in a lot of different ranges. They're very highly customizable and you can use them on patients with regular corneas or irregular corneas. Don't be afraid to take pictures and videos and send them to your consultants because they can help you so much. But if you don't describe to them what you're seeing properly, um, just take photos, send it to them. They can use those to make changes as needed. Basic GP rules like SAMFAP and Vertex still very much apply. 
remember the foundation of scleral lenses. We're vaulting the cornea, vaulting the limbus, landing on the conge as smoothly as possible. And probably the most important things are lens care and lens handling. Like if you can't put the lens on, it doesn't matter how beautiful the fit is, patient's not going to wear it. And that's actually the number one reason why patients fail scleral lenses, because they can't put them on and take them off on their own. And then remember, follow up as much as you think you need. Uh, don't be afraid to have the patients come in more often than not. Explain to them, this is why we're charging so much for this fit, because it's much more complicated and I'm gonna see you a lot more, so I need to charge for my chair time. Um, if you enjoyed today's lecture and wanna stay up to date with all of the scleral lens information out there, I really urge you guys to join the Scleral Lens Education Society. It's completely free membership wise. You get access to a ton of educational videos. We promise to not spam you too much. Um, here's the QR code. The registration page takes less than one minute. And, you know, if you guys really get into this and you're like, yeah, sclerals are my jam, you know, become a fellow afterwards after becoming a member. If you're a student at UHCO, I know a lot of you are listening right now. Myself, Dr. Kaufman, Dr. Walker, Dr. Kelsey Skidmore, we're all fellows. Dr. Logan, we're all sclerals, fellows of the Scleral Lens Education Society, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, otherwise, feel free to join us in the future. We have two upcoming webinars as well. That's also free and, and we'd love to have you listening and we can take any questions you guys may have. Perfect, thank you guys so much. That was amazing. Um, and we do have a few questions. So uh, Lauren Johnson asks, do you have any tips on refracting? Do you use J and D like in low vision to have an efficient refraction? Well, that's a good question. that is a good question. Everyone's a little different. It depends a lot on the type of cornea you're refracting. If I'm starting from scratch, I mean, honestly, I sometimes get a refraction, but I do those really, really big steps. Um, I use the patient a lot. Like I mentioned earlier, if I'm fishing for still, I put a diopter of still in there and have the patient, I put their hand up and have them actually twist it back and forth to see where their seal is. At that point, once we find a round where the axis is, where they perceive it's a lot more clear, then I start doing refraction as normal, adding still, tweaking the axis, mm -hmm. seeing if we can get a little bit better there. Mm -hmm. I think okay. being realistic too, you guys, if your patient has a lot of scarring or it's just really highly irregular, um, there's only so much a scleral lens can do. So we didn't go into all the advanced things, but at UH, we have like a wavefront aberrometer that can actually measure higher order aberrations. So your patient might need a lens with advanced optics. And that's actually starting to roll out at the different manufacturers. So it's very exciting. Great. All right, well, we have another question from Shandani Nanavati. Uh, she asks, can you elaborate what corneal topography scale is the most important when fitting scleral lenses, axial, tangential, or do you guys use elevation, or what do you guys recommend? Gosh, I use a mix of it. How do you talk to your students in clinic? Um, so usually I will tell them like, hey, if you are focusing on the peripheral cornea, tangential all the way, but in reality, I feel like I use the elevation map the most because I need to know which areas are the most depressed and which areas are the most elevated because I need that lens to go over all of it, right? And so mm -hmm. I feel like I definitely use axial the least and probably elevation the most. That's super helpful. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, Catherine Aquino asks, is it okay to nap with sclerals? And also, is it okay with, to swim with sclerals with goggles on, of course? Probably mixed in the literature. Mm -hmm. Personally, when I tell patients, because I do get a lot of swimmers, I'm a swimmer. I do swim in my contacts with goggles on, or if they go on vacation, um, these patients, a lot of the time, they can't function without them. So you're looking at the risk benefit of wearing the lenses. They need to see safety reasons. So if they are going to swim with their swirls, they're an athlete, I say it's okay, but when they get done, take it off, really clean the lens. So you have them put some preservative-free artificial tears on before putting the lens back on and then wearing it the rest of their day. What would you say, Karen, when you're talking to your patients? So 
one thing that you have to keep in mind, you guys, these are still pretty new, right? Slurls have been around, but we don't have a ton of data on this. You'd be surprised all the crazy questions we get, like, can I skydive in these? And can I do hot yoga in these lenses? And I'm just like, I don't know, because no one's actually studied them. If you're a student and you're in the master's program, get your classmates to go snorkeling in these lenses and let me know how that goes. Uh, but otherwise, use your best judgment, right? Just let them know, napping, not great. Can I stop you? Not necessarily, but if your eye feels uncomfortable or red, just like all your other contacts, take them out, call me if the redness isn't improving and the comfort's not improving, um, and maybe don't nap in them again if, if you are having a poor reaction to it. Good question. Kind of, kind of like at your own risk, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Um, so Dietrich Coulter asks, um, if there isn't enough apical, uh, apical clearance superior, but enough inferior, what type of change do you make to the lens? So that's a good one. Uh, usually that happens when you have lens drop, where that scleral lens is literally dropping down on the eye. So it's very snug up superior and then inferior, you have like this belly of a, of a lens, you have a lot of clearance there. That kind of tells me that maybe the landing zone is not quite as aligned to the sclera as possible. And so you're just having some misalignments or maybe you just have way too much clearance and it's very heavy and it's pulling that lens down. So what I would do in that case, take your finger, nudge it, center it, right? Get that tear lens to look a little more uniform and then try to see, is my central clearance like crazy high? Or maybe I have a lot of blanching up top or edge lift up top. Something maybe is not quite so aligned. Anything to add, Kelsey? No, I would agree. Most of the time it's an alignment issue. You need to center lens more properly. This is when torque haptics are helpful. Sometimes it's perfectly centered, but maybe they have an elevation there. Um, definitely in some of the graft patients. I'll usually make sure it's centered, like Karen was saying, and then many of these designs, like we mentioned earlier, talk to the consultants. Some of them, you can actually adjust the clearance just in that meridian. There's a lot you can do with these lenses. That's when the scleral topography comes in handy because you can customize these areas. You can lift it in the limbal clearance just in that one clock hour. So make sure you're documenting exactly, maybe from one to two o'clock you're having touch, document it in a chart so you can monitor that area really closely. Mm -hmm. Awesome. If the cornea health is not affected, maybe you don't have to change it. Like take that lens off. Superior limbus looks good. Good. Leave it. Don't don't mess with it. Yeah, there were a couple of questions on that about uneven clearance, and I think that's really helpful. And there are a couple of questions also on limbal clearance. Um, what do you guys look for? What is the limbal clearance that you want to have? And also, if you have touch at the limbus, will the patient have any symptoms? Um, what do you look for at follow-up? Mm -hmm. So at follow-up, um, after we put the fluorescein in, looking really just for that faint green band, like it's almost invisible, because again, it's 50 microns, that's barely thicker than your epithelium, right? Uh, from there, if I don't really see it, any clearance and I'm like not sure, take the lens off, you're looking for signs of limbal staining, uh, maybe even breakdown of the limbal tissue. And again, if I'm not seeing any of that, I'm probably going to leave it alone. If you have too much limbal clearance, you might see, you know, signs of limbal edema. You might have symptoms like fogging where the vision just kind of gets like a little hazy throughout the day uh, long as the patient wears the lens. A lot of these really awesome fitting questions you guys have you guys got to check out the Scleral Lens Education Society YouTube page because we have a ton of videos up that go into like how to fit. And so once you get the encounter flow down, then you can kind of fine tune your education and start thinking, how do I make these changes? The main goal for today was when you see a Scleral Lens patient in your chair, don't panic, don't freeze, don't freak out. Just go through your flow and, and gather the information you need. But yeah, very good questions. Very good advice. And I am I think this will be the last question. Um, you know how sometimes you get those patients with the impression marks after they remove their lens? Um, you guys have an appropriate solution for that. Uh, in that case, would you just loosen or flatten the peripheral curves or what do you recommend? First, I ask how much force the patient's using. 
a lot of the time when I'm inserting the lens, I put it on and ask them, are you putting on the same amount of force I just did? Are you going lighter? Are you going heavier? I would say at least half the time I'm seeing that ring because they are so worried about bubbles, they're jamming it into mm -hmm. their eyes. So making sure first that they're not using too much force to put it on, usually going gentle, they come back a week or two later and they're like, talk, it's gone. Unless I wear my lens 14 hours and I sleep in it. Yeah, agree. And in terms of haptic changes, I think one of the more common mistakes is if you go too small in diameter. So we tell our students start with HVID plus three, so that it leaves you with like 1.5 millimeters on either side. So you can kind of spread the weight of that lens out. If you don't have enough room there to spread that lens out, it's that whole snowshoe versus like stiletto high heel in the snow, right? It's just gonna dig in onto that conge and create that ring. And so if they are adamant that they are putting it on not forcefully, and I usually will spy on them and be like, okay, go ahead and put your lens on before you leave. And I'm like watching from the side, like, how are you doing this? Um, if they're truly putting it on right, then I'm gonna think, yeah, maybe I need to flatten my haptics, but maybe I also need to widen my haptics and go to a slightly larger overall diameter to share some of that weight on the eye. Great question. Awesome, guys. That was really amazing. Thank you so much again for giving us your time tonight. That was super informative and I loved it. And I know our listeners did too. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, guys. Take care.